we've talked a lot about the compressive failure of rock, or the compressive strength of rock, right? And all these different constitutive models, um, of course, starting with more Coulomb and adding complexity, Drucker Prager and Hope Brown, and Cam Clay, and all the way up to, you know, the, the last one I presented was the, the so-called Sandia Geo model, or Cayenta, which is the most complicated model I know. And all of those really deal with the compressive strength of rock. All of those, uh, if you remember those sort of conic shapes uh, that sig signify the yield surface, they all come to a point in the tensile regime, right? And effectively, that point, for the most part, you can consider it comes to a point near zero. So most rocks have very little or no tensile strength. And for that reason, it's relatively unimportant. And that's essentially all you need to know about the tensile strength of rock. It's relatively unimportant compared to the compressive strength of rock. And of course, we're also talking about, you know, in the context of petroleum engineering applications, well, like I said, the tensile strength is, comp is low compared to the compressive strength. Um, when a large enough volume of rock is considered, flaws are bound to exist, right? So ultimately, we're going to implement some models and do computations or something like that. And if we want to do computations on a reservoir scale, even with supercomputers, our, our sort of representative volume that we're going to discretize could be the size of this room, right? Because you know, we're, we're going to take a, a reservoir that's a few kilometers long, maybe, and a, a few hundred, or a, a few tens of to hundreds of meters thick, and we're going to break it up into little chunks and do computations on them. And it turns out those little chunks aren't so little, they could be the size of this room, right? Well, any chunk of rock the size of this room is going to have at least thousands upon thousands of micro cracks in it, small flaws. Right? And quite possibly very large flaws, faults, you know, that, that completely disjoin the rock. Right? And so, you know, if you take any large enough piece of rock that we're interested in studying in a petroleum engineering application, if you put it under any kind of tensile strength, there's either going to be large flaws that already exist and therefore can't hold any tension, or all of the thousands of micro flaws in there will coalesce almost instantaneously when you put any kind of tension on it. And the final reason, again, because you know, we're interested in petroleum engineering applications, the in-situ stress at depth is virtually never tensile. Right? It's, it's basically always compressive. Right? So, the stress, so the, that's why we don't care that much about the tensile strength of the rock. Okay? There is one application in petroleum engineering where we do care about the tensile strength of rock, and that's hydraulic fracture, right? And so, I mean, we're going to talk, we're going to, uh, I'm presenting this here uh, briefly, but we're going to spend a few weeks at the end of the course, the last few weeks of the course, essentially will be completely dedicated to discussing hydraulic fracture, mechanics of hydraulic fracture. Uh, but I just presented here in this discussion of tensile strength, and that's because, um, so we can't actually characterize, I mean, obviously, if, if I take a a crack, and I, and I have a crack, and I pull on the two sides of it. I'm putting the tip of the crack in tension, right? But we can't actually characterize the uh, stress at the tip of the crack with the current model that we've introduced, right? The, the current model that we've introduced says um, that the stress is some function of strain, right? And we said that strain, at least in one dimension, is like partial u partial x in the x direction, right? So in one dimension. Well, u is the displacement. And at the tip of a crack, mathematically, a crack represents a jump discontinuity in displacement. And I can't take the partial derivative at a discontinuity is undefined. So, so this thing doesn't exist, which causes the, the mathematical model we've introduced the stress is actually infinite at the cr tip of the crack, okay? So what we, what we do to account for that, to account for, now in, in reality, 
stress is never infinite, right? They're, they're stress at the tip of the crack in reality. And so it's a flaw in our model, right? Our model works good away from cracks, but right at the tip of the crack, there seems to be a flaw in it. Because in reality, um, stress can't be infinite because if stress was infinite, it, mean, it would mean that there'd be infinite force, right? And we can't apply infinite force to any body. So uh, the reality is the stress is finite. And it's finite because there's lots of sort of inelasticity happening at the tip of a crack, a process zone, OK? Uh, and this could be all these, like I mentioned earlier, micro flaws coalescing, which dissipate energy. Um, and other things, right? So the way we characterize the process zone at the tip of a crack in fracture mechanics, and we'll talk more about it later, is something called a stress intensity factor, okay? And so in this um, equation here, that's K1, okay? And so we have a model that says that when the stress intensity factor exceeds some critical value, then the crack will propagate, okay? <coughs> And that critical value we've denoted K1C here, uh, this is called the fracture toughness. And, and the fracture toughness is a material property. Okay? It's just like Young's modulus or Poisson ratio. And it's independent of those guys. Okay? So while, do you have a question? So while um, it's often that materials have that have high, I mean, that have high stiffness, high Young's modulus, right? Will also have high fracture toughness. That's not always the case. They're independent material quant uh, quantities, and that and an example would be steel, right? Steel is a material that has is very stiff, 200 gigapascal Young's modulus, and it and it's very tough. It's very resistant to fracture growth. Okay. Uh, however, an alternative material that, that, that doesn't follow that rule is a ceramic. Right? So ceramic is stiffer than steel. C ceramics are very, very stiff, but they're very, very brittle. They have very, very low fracture toughness uh, in the sense that, um, so what the fracture toughness is, is a, essentially it's the material's resistance to, uh, to fracture growth, to, a, to an existing crack propagating. And if you have an existing crack in a ceramic, it will propagate very under very small loads. Right? However, if you push on a ceramic in pure compression, it's a very, very strong material. Right? It's very difficult to, to deform it. Right? So it's kind of a couple examples there. Now, um, so the simplest model for uh, you know, what we call mode one fracture, that would be where you know, if you have a fracture that's pressurized internally, they're just pushing the faces of the fracture apart um, and the crack growing in, a, in a one direction. Uh, that would be a mode one fracture. And the simple model for that in, in hydraulic fracturing application in an infinite body is that right there, where the, the pore pressure, the fluid pore pressure inside the crack um, minus the vertical stress applied to the crack, uh, so that, that's, that's called what we call the net pressure. Right? This is called the net pressure. net times pi times the square root of L, right? Well, because you have this square root of L thing, what you see is that uh, at very small fracture lengths, right, very small fracture lengths, it takes large net pressures to propagate the crack, right? But as the crack gets longer, the, the, the stress intensity factor is attenuated by the square root of L, and so it drops off rapidly. So we call this sort of early regime a toughness dominated regime. And then later on, the fracture toughness doesn't matter as much. It's more just the net pressure. And really, what we'll see also is that in this regime, you know, again, we're not going to all the discussion of hydraulic fracturing here. But in this regime, as the fracture gets longer, remember these fractures are very, very narrow right? in reality. And hydraulic fracture can be very long, but it's very narrow. And and what it what it essentially takes to continue propagation of the fracture for very long fracture lengths is actually controlled by the viscosity of the fluid, right? Because you have a very, very narrow channel and you're trying to pump fluid through it. And eventually when the fracture is long enough, it's more difficult just to continue to pump that fluid as uh, 
to, to maintain the net pressure you need to, to, to propagate the, the uh, to propagate the fracture and the actual stress intensity at the tip of the fracture doesn't really matter so you transition from what we call this toughness dominated regime to, to a viscosity dominated regime in the long term and we're gonna we're gonna talk about you know again two or three weeks talking about the mechanics of hydraulic fracturing but this is just a prelude of things to come so really the only time the tensile the tensile loading, really. Right? Here we're not even necessarily talking about the tensile strength of the rock, but rather the tensile loading matters is in a hydraulic fracture application. Yeah. That graph on the y-axis, that's the correct? That's the net pressure. That's the difference between the vertical stress in this case. If you imagine the cracks going horizontally, the fractures going horizontally. Uh, it's the difference between the vertical stress and the, and the, and the pressure in the fracture. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's saying at low, at low, at at low, low fracture lengths, it, it takes a, a large yeah. p-net to propagate a fracture. But as, you, as the fracture grows, because the, the, equations you know, the stress intensity is attenuated by the length, then... And again, there's a lot of simplifications in this model. This is assuming that... It's an elliptical shaped fracture growing in an infinite body, uh, loaded exactly like that, not considering any poroelastic effects. Right, so there's a lot of, lot of assumptions in this model, but this is kind of the simplest thing you can do.